I'm Nicolas Bornois of Capital Link, and I would like to welcome you to our panel session on the future of the offshore supply and wind construction sector moving into renewables. This sector is a sector of major growth opportunity for Norway and also around the world. Uh, and uh, we're delighted to have with us uh, Ina Arneson and uh, Jasper Skong from uh, Farnleys. I would like to thank Farnleys for the great cooperation and partnership we have uh, in the organization of our forums and for their support for this forum and for putting together this excellent panel. I would like to thank all the panelists, but I would uh, leave uh, Ina and uh, Jasper to uh, take over, introduce the panelists. I just want to say a big thank you from me. We are going to start with short presentations by Ina and Jasper, and then we go into the panel discussion. Again, thank you very much for me. All right, thanks, Nicholas. Hi, everyone, and uh, thanks for watching this panel discussion today. Um, I'm Ina Arneson, and I work as a renewables advisor in Fernlease. Uh, my colleague Jesper and I uh, will start this session by a short presentation of the offshore wind construction and uh, service sector before moving on to the panel debate and a, uh, a Q&A with questions from the audience if time allows. Um, but first, uh, I think we should do a short introduction of the panelists. Uh, Mikkel, would you like to start? Yes, I can do that. So hello, everybody. So my name is Mikkel. Uh, I'm the CEO of Kettler and based in Copenhagen. Happy to be here. Uh, Johan? Yes, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Johan Sandberg. I'm a head of business development in Arker Offshore Wind. Okay, Alexandra? Hello everybody, I'm Alexandra Kofod. I am the CEO of Fred Olsen Wind Carrier, based in Oslo. Okay, Håkon. Uh, yeah, hi, uh, I'm Håkon Mewang. I'm the Chief Commercial Officer of uh, Edda Wind. Uh, we're based on the west coast of, uh, of Norway. And Morten. Yeah, hello everybody. I'm Morten Svendt. I'm uh, Head of uh, Marine in uh, Equinor, uh, mainly concentrating for the Norwegian Continental Shelf. Okay, thanks for your introductions. Um, so then let's move on to a little background information on offshore wind construction. I will share my screen. Okay, uh, do you see my screen now? Yes. Yeah, okay. <laughs> So um, earlier this year, uh, Vestas launched their 15 megawatt uh, offshore wind turbine, which is uh, the largest turbine uh, that's been ever uh, announced. Uh, Siemens Gamesa and GE are, are right behind with their 14 megawatt uh, designs. Uh, and all of these huge turbines are expected to be ready for uh, installation around 2024. As the graph on the left side shows, uh, the Turbine sizes has generally continuously uh, increased since the first offshore wind farm in 1991. And we do con uh, expect that it will continue to, to increase beyond the, this 15 megawatts as well. Um, so to accommodate for these huge turbines, uh, the foundation sizes will also increase. This means that the foundation installation vessel, uh, whether it be a floating crane vessel as the one pictured here or or a jack-up will need to be capable of installing heavy foundations uh, as well as foundations with, um, with a large footprint requiring a high um, lift radius to be able to lift and install the foundation off the side of the vessel. The wind turbine jack-up installation vessels also need to in, be able to install increasingly heavy components as well as increase at uh, increasing hub heights. But in addition to this, wind farms are also generally moving further from shore and into deeper waters, requiring also the, the legs of the jack-up to be, to be longer. And speaking of uh, deep water, floating offshore wind is also expected to, to drastically increase uh, its market share going forward. And um, while there are several different designs for this floater foundation, um, common for a lot of them is that they rely on the on a tug to, to tow to site the fully assembled turbine and foundation. So um, how does the future of offshore wind construction look? 
hopefully our, our panelists will be able to help us uh, answer that. Um, and with this, I, I pass the word over to you, Jesper, to say a few words on the SOV market. Thank you, Ina. Uh, just quickly, since I didn't get an introduction, my name is Jasper Shong, and I'm a, a market analyst with Fernley Offshore Supply. We focus on uh, specialized vessel operations and, and uh, segments, and as such, we cover the SOV, uh, SOV segments and also uh, other related uh, uh, vessel segments for this uh, industry. But we see a very clear tendency and sort of in line with following what Ina, the trends Ina uh, showed us just now, that SOVs are, uh, sees a growing demand uh, and is caused by a multitude of factors. Obviously, it's the distance from shore and the increase in, in turbine sizes that is a direct result of the large scale offshore wind that we're all seeing the trend moving towards. Uh, but SOVs are also increasing the accessibility window, which dramatically reduces O&M costs. Uh, we see compared to CTVs that uh, significant weight heights uh, comes into play, but also wind restrictions. And uh, you can actually increase uptime for, from O&M operation from 60 to 80 percent. It's also the competitiveness is increased further by clustered offshore wind farm because you could only increase, that increases the capacity uh, uh, installed to expand. And uh, you're seeing uh, the ability to have engineers be on site for a longer duration and to a larger degree and in larger numbers is actually a, a great significant increase in efficiency. And we see the trade-offs very clearly established sort of already where the SOV versus CTV parity was hit uh, actually a few years ago, uh, and we, we pegged that to 40 kilometers from shore, which is uh, very much the case for a lot of the future and current installate, installed wind, offshore wind park. If we move to the next slide, uh, we also see in terms of the SOV fleet development, there's a few interesting things because if we bear in mind the 40 kilometer from shore aspect, there is actually more than 50 forecasted wind farms expected to be commissioned by 2030. And in the next decade, we see that there is more than 32 or there's 32 wind farms, offshore wind farms that would need further SOV charters uh, going into it. And if we lay that on top of the fleet development for these purpose-built vessels, you see that actually the numbering in the foreseeable future and in the current pipeline is actually just uh, up to 36 vessels. So you have a mix of traditional SOV players as well as uh, uh, some recent debutants entering this market. And I think it's a very interesting market to, to be discussed. Um, and while the majority of the SOV new, new builds coming into the market are intended for European, Europe. Uh, we also see some other uh, entrants like Edison's West for the US and TSS Marine in Taiwan. And there's also from uh, our market intel a large amount of smaller CTV owners that wants to take the leap towards the SOV market as they recognize the trends uh, that we just discussed. So um, that's a little context for the to, to set the mood for our uh, upcoming uh, panel discussion. And I'll leave it to you, Ina, to uh, to. Uh, break the first question. All right, thank you, Esper. Okay, so first question. Um, I will start by directing this to, to Alexandra. How, uh, how big will the turbine get? Is it enough to order a vessel for 15 megawatts if you were to order it today? <laughs> I think we've been discussing turbine sizes for the last 10 years, and then we've also been discussing how big will they get for the last 10 years. And I, I don't think anybody has the answer. What I, what I am positive is that the turbines will get larger. Um, I think we are in close dialogue with clients all the time to understand where their future vessel requirements will be. And I think it's also the fact that there's a very clear sort of now power curve race between the turbine suppliers. Whoever can provide the best power curve will win the project. So as long as we see uh, project economics improving by these larger turbines, I think we will see the, the trend continuing. Uh, what I think is also, also worth mentioning is uh, I, I think the supply chain as a whole, including turbine suppliers, might prefer that this was going a little bit slower. <laughs> but it, it's, it's definitely going to keep growing. Yeah. Mikkel, anything to add on this? 
I, I agree with Alexandra. I think it's a fact that it will continue to grow. And, and to answer your question, I don't think it's enough to order a new build against a 15 megawatt turbine. I think that um, since we are building on a 20 to 25 year uh, lifetime of these vessels, we need to look quite far out in the future and have some quite educated uh, guesses, if you want to call it that, uh, around uh, how turbines will look, uh, not only from a size perspective, but in general in 20 years. Mm. So, um, Johan, how do you see, what is uh, the future split, or how, what do you think is the future split between bottom fixed and floating offshore wind? Yeah, I think that, that's a great question. We, um, I maybe didn't mention that in my introduction, but as an offshore wind developer, we are focusing on the deep water segment of the market. So we're basically focusing almost only on floating wind turbines. So, so uh, yeah, we have a great uh, faith in that industry. We think it's going to have a tremendous growth in the both near term and, and uh, long term future, obviously. But I think it's very difficult to, to say a split in terms of a percentage, uh, say in 2050. It will be very dependent on the individual markets. So floating wind will, to a large extent, be driven by lack of access to shallower waters. So we see, for instance, in the mar big markets like Japan and Scotland and even here in Norway, uh, there is actually a shortage of shallow water for suitable for bottom fixed. Uh, but what we do think is that it will be a, a pretty significant part of the market. And we've seen also uh, forecasts and projections by various institutes that also confirm this. Mm. So, for instance, DMBGL's uh, Energy Transition Outlook, they have now split offshore wind into bottom fixed and floating. So that also emphasizes the, the large share of floating in the future. Mm. And uh, Mikkel, does the jack-up installation vessel have a place in floating offshore wind? In some and if yes, what is it? I think in some projects they do, um, especially because one of the big limitations that uh, is not really dealt with to, uh, let's say, a detailed enough discussion, so to speak, uh, is the infrastructure challenge around floating wind. Because um, if you have seen one of those foundations, even one of the leaner ones uh, with a 3.6 megawatt turbine on top of it, and you see how big it is. And if you were to then line up a hundred of those uh, for a commercial operation of a wind farm, um, then it's certainly a, a logistical challenge that I don't think there's a solution to yet. Uh, and we see some of the floating wind farms that are being developed at the moment on commercial scale, because this is what in, what's interesting for me. Um, they, are, they are looking at utilizing uh, a range of different logistical setups, amongst others at Jacob. But we are welcoming offshore wind. It's a part of the value chain. It's something we are looking forward to be an active part of. Um, so, yeah, we, we do believe it will be a, a, a portion of the, of, of the market also. Um, I'm willing to give a percentage. I think it's between 10 and 15 percent it will form. Okay, um, and uh, what about these the smaller jackups that, that can no longer be used for installing the new turbines? Where do we see them uh, going? Is it oil and gas decommissioning operations and maintenance for, for smaller wind farms? Or, or will we see them moving to the Asian markets, which have a, are expected to have a slightly lower turbine size uh, for a few years uh, to come? Uh, Alexandra, do you have a view on that? I think you see a mix across the, the industry. Um, yes, there are some, some smaller uh, jackups. We see some assets are moving out to China as they have a very, very high activity. I think what are the sort of uh, states of the art assets as of today? We will, I believe we will see a significant uh, amount of those being upgraded. That includes the, the Cuddler vessels as, uh, as well as our own. Uh, and there is there are some general trends in the market, but I think the overall there are several factors to to consider whether a vessel can install a project. But the, the most important bit is the size of the crane because the hub height you do not get away from, and then uh, distance to shore, water depth, and uh, project size, and many other things will then affect how efficient a vessel will be on each project. But we also think in, in terms of floating wind, as you mentioned that, uh, that, that Jacobs, uh, I think Mikkel alluded to it with these logistical challenges. Uh, these floating wind turbines still need to be assembled 
uh, and that will still require very significant cranes due to mm -hmm. size and how bite and so on. And uh, we are working on, on specific solutions on this towards several developers, including sort of uh, our sister company, Fred Olsen Renewables, which are involved in, in leases for, for floating wind. Okay, thank you. Anyone, uh, anything to add? Okay, I'll pass the word on to, to Jesper for a few questions. Thank you, Ina. So um, it's interesting we get into the offer uh, floating bit so uh, so fast because uh, could we actually see uh, a reduced or a slightly stagnating demand for uh, installation assets for for floating with an uptick continued uptick in floating offshore uh, uh, um, turbines? Sorry, Alexandra. In, in terms of floating wind, yes, it's a market that will see a significant growth rate. But I think uh, I, and it depends on the timeline you're looking at, but I think sort of industry consensus is that sort of looking at the end of this decade, you're probably looking at 10 to 15% of the market being floating and the remaining is bottom fixed. And, and, and what happens in 2050, I think that would be difficult to predict, but I, I think it's fair to say bottom fixed will be the majority of the market for a long time still. Understood. But to bring uh, Morton into this discussion, um, I mean, uh, what about maintenance and repair for these floating units? Uh, is, is there a tote to shore uh, for maintenance uh, realistic uh, alternative here? I think at the current moment for me that that's really <clears throat> hard to say. Of of course we will be be looking at the most possible uh, uptime and, and uh, reliability from our production and, and and we'll need to to look at various uh, issues there. But that's not really in the in the core of my competence to say at the moment. I'm, I'm afraid. Well, that's that's fair. Uh, Hokon, uh, will the uptake in offshore wind in North America and Asia? Um, will that impact SOV designs and uh, be specialized for these areas? Uh, rather, other, would we see other specializations for these areas than the current uh, European-centric uh, designs? No, I, I don't believe so. Not, 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 not dramatically different. Of course, um, what what we do need in, in in the SOV market and would be would be at least. Nice to have is, is, is standardization in, in rules, regulations, etc., uh, amongst uh, countries. Uh, but uh, to, but apart from having to modify to to accommodate uh, to 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 different regulations, uh, I think the general designs we we can pretty much uh, transfer. Uh, they're working very well in 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 in, in uh, harsh conditions in in Europe. I think, uh, in fact, your uh, you're a bit modest on our, on our behalf when you're saying 2.5, 3 meters significant. We can work well in excess of, of 3 meters and get uptime of, of uh, yeah, more than 90%, uh, 95% in some cases. Uh, and I think that's, that's very transferable. Uh, obviously, uh, if, you, if you're thinking North, North America specifically, uh, there's the Jones Act. So you have to build in the US and you have to adapt slightly to accommodate building techniques, et cetera, at yards there. But... Uh, in general, I think uh, vessel designs uh, are pretty much transferable among uh, among regions uh, worldwide. Thank you, noted. And uh, Mikkel mentioned uh, 24, 25 year lifespan, and that's pretty close to what we used to see in the OSV industry. What about the uh, the economic lifetime of call it tomorrow's SOV? Since I had the <coughs> significant wave height and such an uptime wrong. Um, I, I'd say I'd say at least 25. Uh, we're 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 calculating 30 years, uh, which is what we've traditionally had the, uh, in our oil and gas uh, business, or our owners have had as well. Uh, so so with a with a good maintenance regime, uh, you can definitely go 30 years, uh, particularly if you future proof the the vessels, uh, both for 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 floating uh, wind and and also uh, with thinking of of uh, zero emission technologies. So then you can definitely. Calculate 30 years. Cool. And Morton, your demand for SOVs, I mean, will the future walk to work systems evolve to be suited more specifically to two structures in motions? So, will there be specialized SOVs for floating wind uh, that you guys require? 
Uh, I think uh, it's it's quite possible that uh, the floating parks will require their own vessels and designs when it comes to like the uh, adapted DP uh, systems and uh, uh, further developed gangway systems and so on uh, in order to provide for the the optimum uh, reliability and and I also think uh, with the, with the technological development going on uh, just to to mirror what uh, Hawkon just said that the we need to come up with with designs that will last uh, for a long time, uh, and that can stay with uh, with the industry for a long time. I.e., being future proofed when it comes to uh, propulsion, uh, low emission technology, and so on as well. Thank you, Tina. Yeah. Um, and uh, that that was actually a very good ending of your uh, of your um, answer, Martin, because that brings me on to the next question. Um, offshore wind is is an industry which demands the entire supply chain to be to be uh, renewable or to be as green or low carbon as possible. Um, so this is a question. First, maybe for the the vessel owners, um, how. Uh, how are you working towards zero emission of the vessels um, in offshore wind construction and uh, and the SOVs? Uh, what will your new builds be running on? Is it LNG, batteries, or or other energy efficiency measures? Um, Mikkel, would you like to start? Yes, I can. Uh, so I would first of all like to say that uh, we are we are not uh, working towards uh, zero emission vessels. We are working towards a zero emission company. Uh, because it goes beyond the vessels, it goes to how we buy, where do we buy, where do we repair, where do we build things and all of that. And, and that's how we think. So I know everybody is focused on the vessel and whether we put batteries in the vessel or not. We are, we are focusing more on the entire value chain because this is where it really makes sense. Uh, when that is said, we are obviously as a company who have announced that we are, we are going to, uh, to build two new units. Uh, we are very focused on this, but we also focused on our existing assets and we are looking at various technologies. So. Yes, certainly they will be uh, hybrid uh, solutions that we are coming with to the market. There will be uh, a multitude of, of, of different solutions that we will be uh, that we will be focusing on, um, and, and we can see already now from our from our uh, engineering studies that we will be able to do every mega that at a totally different carbon footprint, and that's very encouraging. Uh, but it's only the start of the journey. But I would say some of the technology we would like to get our hands on today is not really available. And, and as, as I've said in the past, you know, everybody is looking at, for example, fuel cells and all of that. It doesn't really work well for us because we have to lift it up into the air when we get out and the efficiency is not great. So we have to look at, at technologies that might exist in 10 years. And it's all around when you design this vessel, not only do you have to design it for turbines, you don't know how they look today. You also have to design the vessel for, for technologies that are not in the market today. But we are, we are teaming up with everybody who is knowing anything about this. And we have just done a large study on our existing assets together with the Danish Technical University. And I'll say, we, we gather knowledge every day that is bringing us forward every day, but it's, it's really around taking the small step and to do compounded uh, uh, improvements. Thank you. Um, Alexandra? I think to, to a large degree, I, I um, extend I agree with, with Mikkel. Um, there, there are some readily available technology that unfortunately were not implemented in these vessels when they were built 10 years ago. You can talk about energy and heat recovery. Uh, you can reduce energy consumption, uh, variable frequency drives, battery spinning reserves. That, that's technology which is readily available today. And I think clearly they will be probably implemented in every new build coming out. Um, and implemented in existing vessels as long as it you know makes financial sense uh, in terms of new fuels and so on i think that's probably a little further away for at least construction vessels as we operate in different ports <laughs> every year or maybe t twice a year um, and again i think there are lots of lower hanging fruits uh, in in much simpler things such as just behavioral on board making sure you go an economical speed when you know, it, it's it's not necessary, um, and and I would also sort of argue that uh, upgrading existing vessels actually, it, it, they won't be as technologically fancy as the uh, any new build will be, but they are built, and that those emissions are already uh, out there. So, uh, and then we have sort of green financing based on upgrading existing vessels being more efficient in installing megawatts. So, 
Okay, thank you. Håkon. Uh, yeah, no. Uh, yeah, Håkon, uh, do you have anything to add? Is this different for, for SOVs? Hey, it, it certainly is. Um, first, uh, I, I'd like to I agree with Mikkel and Alexandra, and, and you have to look at the totality of this, and it's a, it's a sustainability uh, issue that, that, that involves our entire supply chain, not just the, the actual operations of, of the vessel, but, uh, but the construction and purchasing, all of that, 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 that that's been mentioned. Uh, with that being said, we, we've been very specific uh, about uh, our vessels. They're obviously all, uh, all prepared uh, for, for, for zero emission. Um, our, we have a, an extensive new building program uh, ongoing. Um, and, and we have a, a hydrogen-based concept uh, that we are developing along, uh, along with partners uh, now. Um, and, and we're confident that uh, in, in by 2025, we'll be able to, to commercially develop a, a zero emission vessel uh, to, to operate uh, in a wind farm. Um, so, so we've been very specific about those ambitions, and and uh, and we'll make that uh, we'll make that happen. So, so for SOVs, it's it's actually um, quite a tangible uh, thing. It's it's realistic that in a, in a few years uh, we'll be able to do it. But uh, for for other vessel types, it's uh, it, there's, there there are other considerations, of course. Thank you. And. Uh... I guess for uh, and when we're on the topic of emissions, oil and gas operators have set emission targets for or limits rather for marine operations. Uh, Morten and Johan, is there is there anything uh, like that that's on the pipeline for uh, for operators in offshore wind? If I start, oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Go ahead, Johan. Yeah, I, Johan I, def first. I definitely think so, and. Uh, I think we, we sometimes tend to overestimate what's going to happen in a few years time, but we tend to underestimate the, the quite radical things that will happen in about 10 years time. And uh, as we've alluded to before, floating wind is going to take another few years before it really takes off. So I think for, for the large scale floating wind projects, uh, they're probably going to be about 10 years from now. And by then, I'm pretty sure the, the industry will expect very low emissions from the entire operations of the field. And we are already now looking at the supply chain as well, see if we can source green steel for the projects and so on as well. Thank you. And Morten, you had something to add or wanted to uh, share with us? Yes. Yeah, yeah, sure. As a, as a charter of vessels, uh, we, we often end up or we mainly end up paying for the fuel as well. So, on. And so of course, this is of, um, both, of course, uh, due to the emissions and, and sustainability issue, but also there is a, the financial aspect as well. And, I think regardless of which fuel ones, uh, one ends up with, uh, I think energy efficiency measures will always be important. Uh, and in the future, I mean, fuels will probably come at, at fairly higher cost than today, regardless of, of which uh, fuel you select. Uh, and then also Equino, we, we have a, a corporate maritime climate ambition uh, supporting the goal that the company will be net zero by 2050. And uh, uh, fuel-wise, we are looking into to several alternatives. Uh, really both as a producer of fuels as well as a, a, a seller and, and also then again a buyer of maritime fuels. And, and, and we are looking along uh, ammonia and hydrogen uh, lines, uh, in co mainly in combination also with carbon capture and storage uh, and also into to biofuels. So uh, there's not like there's not one winning lottery ticket at the moment, but there are a lot of uh, interesting options out there. No, thank you. It's uh, it seems like uh, efficiency gains is at the top priority for for most of you, and you perhaps have an, uh, more than uh, or just as much as everyone else to gain from that. Yeah, I think so. I think you're uh, you're right about that, and I think also I think. Uh, uh, as Alexander also pointed out, that uh, you know uh, uh, the the way you operate the vessel, the attitude of the crews, and so on, it's it's a whole spectrum of uh, of where you actually can can make those uh, continuous improvements that you, you need uh, at the same time as you were chasing the the, the paradigm shifts. So uh, back to, to floating wind uh, a little bit, uh, Johan. Um, levelized cost of energy is, is expected to, to decrease drastically, especially for floating. Um, and turbine sizes and standardization uh, play a large role in this. Uh, does streamlining the marine operations also have a place here in lower Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it, it does have a place here. And I think uh, 
in in wind power or in, in renewables in general efficiency and lean production and a lean mindset from the very top of, of, of all of us working in this industry is absolutely critical. And uh, as I'm sure you know, the, the industry is very often uh, sort of working uh, around uh, reversed auctions and you need to be the lowest bidder in order to actually secure an offtake of, of, for your power. So, so a lean mindset is absolutely crucial all over the industry. Uh, but then obviously having said that, it, it is a very, very big investment cost uh, right up front in the CAPEX investment and then the operation cost comes much later. So, so from a net present value point of view, you, you're, uh, you're probably not going to have as big an impact as you will for the very large uh, upfront costs around fabrication, of course. They, they will play the most role here, the biggest role. Mm. Yeah, and that's... Uh... Um, mostly standardization of this huge floater foundation, right? Yes, it's standardization and it's it's uh, volume and scale. So mm. so uh, we also see, as I'm sure you're aware, there is a very strong demand for local content in many of these markets now. And there is an expectation that much of this will actually be fabricated and manufactured locally in the country. Uh, and that's uh, obviously playing a big role in the ability to reduce costs. So what we, we think will happen is that there will be a modularization type of design where you are able to produce as much as it makes sense to do locally. And then you produce uh, the very complicated or very large and, and difficult components, perhaps in a more centralized way, so that you're able to achieve the scale uh, while also doing as much locally as you possibly can. Mm. Thanks. Well, that's pretty interesting, Yuan, because uh, I guess we're, it's all about uh, adapting and, and, and learning and, and getting experience and, and efficiency in order to increase efficiency. And, and that leads me over to uh, our next question, which is, uh, like, how are you transferring experience from oil and gas into offshore wind? Because most of you have experience from uh, oil and gas, if not still be having a foot within that. Perhaps Morton could uh, shed some light on that to begin with, but it's an open question for everyone. Uh, yeah, sure, Jasper. Uh, my background, and, and I, I, today I work with mainly oil and gas related activities, uh, but we also do support our uh, renewables uh, uh, side uh, when it comes to uh, chartering of vessels and, and so on. Uh, so I think uh, in, in Equinor, we are, are fortunate to have many years experience from uh, maritime operations and, and logistics. And, and that has put us in a position, I'd like to say, uh, to transfer some of that into to offshore wind. Uh, I'm mainly involved with uh, operations and maintenance related activities and the logistics around those. And as a, for instance, uh, when we did uh, the, the chartering process for, for the Dogger Bank uh, contracts, the team that performed that uh, evaluation was made uh, was uh, made up by personnel uh, from across our company, uh, working uh, with gangways, DP related issues, uh, vessel characteristics from uh, experience from the from the North Sea, and so on. Uh, and that, for us, I think, proved very well. So, so yes, we are uh, transferring our experience uh, in that way, and also we are. I'd like to say fortunate enough to have a lot of DP competence, uh, work to work competence in house, and uh, that that allows us to work closely uh, with our suppliers because this is a team effort with uh, with charters and suppliers and so on. And uh, in our oil and gas uh, maritime activities, we've always said that we want to be more than just a transactional buyer of maritime services. Uh, we want to be a, a more of a partner and so on. And I can see that also extends into the, the renewable side when it comes to the SOEs. Thank you. And uh, Håkon, uh, Edda Wind, uh, it's not no secret that you're closely related to Estensjö, a company that's worked in the oil and gas and with Equinor for, uh, for decades now. Uh, where's the most valuable efficiency gains or, or experiences from oil and gas operations for you? Uh, definitely, uh, we're, we're, I mean, that's where we come from, the, the Oestenshire Group uh, originally, uh, and, and with close to 50 years' uh, experience from oil and gas, we'd be, we'd be pretty stupid not to, to leverage that uh, experience. Uh, I think uh, what, we can, what we can use is, is, is there's a lot of gangway, uh, gangway experience, uh, crane uh, experience, DP experience, all of this, vessel design, uh, uh, loads of resources that, that, that we can utilize the, from that uh, 
uh, both in, in, in the design and construction of vessels. Uh, Oestenshire has constructed more than 60 offshore vessels, so, so obviously that's uh, uh, an enormous resource for us to, to tap into uh, uh, in, in that process. Um, uh, and also in, in the operation, we can we, we can we can uh, leverage some experience from our from our sister company uh, at our accommodation that that's uh, done. Uh, yeah, combined, we've probably done more than a couple of million gangway transfers over the last uh, ten years. So 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 that experience is extremely valuable for us. Uh, gains us uh, insights into safety, operability, um, uptime, all, all of that. Uh, and, and obviously uh, should be a benefit uh, to our clients. Thank you. And uh, to the other panelists, are there uh, lessons learned from what not to do? I, I... Please go ahead, Alexandra. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think there are, in your home, I think uh, so there, there's some essential uh, differences between offshore wind and, and oil and gas. As he said, you know, it, it's lower margin and very competitive on cost all the way from the top, from the operators and down the, the complete value chain. Um, and I think the other thing which is worth noticing, offshore wind construction is serial production. It, it's not a one-off. It's uh, typically a, a repetition of 50 to 100 in one wind farm. So you really need to, to think about this as something that you're doing repetitively and it's a real production. And, you know, if you have mistakes, they will, you know, the, the magnifier glass, if you have to look at that mistake hundred times, that, that's painful. So uh, th there are some differences uh, in, in terms of oil and gas and, and offshore wind that you need to, to be aware of and, and really lean and uh, execution is, and repetitively excellent execution is critical. Yeah, I, I just, I concur, obviously, we, we also have a, a history and a legacy from oil and gas in Acker. Uh, I think it was very interesting to see when the offshore wind industry started, you know, more than 10 years ago. And, and I think it was a discussion around whether it will be offshore oil and gas operators going wind or whether it would be onshore wind power going offshore. Uh, and I think we saw sort of a combination of it. We saw it both. Uh, but I think yeah, we were all, or at least I was very impressed by companies who had never really been offshore, how quickly they picked up the culture of safety and so on when they went, went offshore. So say Vattenfall or, or others, big utility companies who'd never been offshore started to build offshore wind and, and they quickly picked up the HSE culture uh, and safety and so on. So uh, they came with the onshore mindset, this very, very lean mindset from onshore wind and so on. I think that's also why we have such successful Danish offshore wind companies as well. They, they also bring that mindset with them, like Mikkel. Thank and you. I, and I think actually specifically that health and safety is one of the areas where we can learn a lot from oil and gas. I think that this is an area where they have excelled in. But I also, I, if I look at the oil and gas industry, it's certainly not an industry that I'm looking to copy anytime soon because there was also a very, very high degree of, of excessiveness in the oil and gas industry that is not allowed for in offshore wind. And I. I have some recent experience from dealing with uh, what we would say the new, uh, they call themselves the energy majors now. Uh, they were the oil majors a couple of months ago. Um, and, uh, and when they started to tender for a project, they came out with this uh, the oil and gas way of doing things and they didn't receive a single bit for their project. And we, we said, this is not how we will execute this project. And they basically had to go into a dialogue with us, you know, and we, we can say that we, we don't have this legacy to the same degree as some of the other companies from oil and gas we do in some sort and form because we used to be owned by a company who serviced oil and gas. But I would say that um, very much second what Alexandra said, we are, we are repetitive. So we are the fort of, of, of oil and gas almost. We are, we are an assembly line thing. We do the same thing 140 times in a year. We don't have luxury of waiting for the right weather window and having to engineer a lift for 12 months and all of that. Um, so there, there's, there's distinct differences and I would caution against trying to, to, to copy oil and gas and I think that the, the energy majors are, are learning this as well that there's, uh, there's two different things uh, and yeah, it, it has to be handled differently as well. Well, thank you. That was certainly uh, quite insightful getting all you in, input on that. And I mean, when we're talking about like margins and, and whatnot, something that's been going to become quite uh, apparent as that a lot of things could be 
uh, robotized or automated or even performed by autonomous operations lately. So we, can we expect autonomy and unmanned platforms to play a central role in offshore wind in the future? I mean, you've seen ROV operations perform maintenance duties in, in uh, oil and gas, but also drone inspections and predictive maintenance and digital twins. And there's a whole sea of, pardon the pun, um, of, of uh, options for uh, automation here. Uh, Alexandra? For sure. I, I think that will enter any industry <laughs> and an offshore wind as well, uh, clearly. And, and um, I think there is a little bit of a way to go because, uh, yes, we have already discussed this is a land-based industry that has moved offshore. And I think um, some of the installation methods, they are still very colored by uh, by this, that's, uh, and, and we very much still assemble turbines the way it was done onshore. But I think the sizes of the turbines will eventually dictate that we come up with uh, smarter solutions to, to install these turbines. When you think about installing uh, blades of, of rotor diameters of, uh, you know, the blades are more than 100 meters long, they're more than 100 meters up in the air. Um, this need to be automated somehow it can't be completely manual as it partly is today so for sure thank you that was a very good point and Hawkon on the sov side are there uh, operations that are likely to be automated going forward any you talk about tomorrow's uh, sovs is there new tech coming into there that you would like to share with us yeah, well, definitely. Uh, there'll be there'll be developments uh, on on the vessel side uh, with with a larger degree of automation uh, and autonomy. You, you'll see it on gangways. Uh, you'll see it on on cranes to to a certain degree and vessels themselves as well. Uh, things will be moving in in that direction, uh, and and we need to to be ahead of the game uh, there. It's, it's also a cost issue. It's uh, as as has been pointed out by, by others. Uh, uh, offshore wind is a, is a game of smaller margins, and and we need to be cost efficient. So, so any automation that that can be done, uh, both for the wind farms and and the, and the vessels, I think uh, will be beneficial and, and and necessary for for uh, energy companies to to be able to produce that energy at a, at a cost efficient uh, level. I think. I completely agree, and uh, I think it's already here. It's already happening. Digital twins, as you mentioned, uh, pretty much everything subsea is taking place with unmanned vehicles and so on. Uh, and also, I think Equinor announced recently that uh, the substation was going to be unmanned for Dogger Bank, even though it's a HVDC substation. So, so uh, again, also learnings coming from from oil and gas there very clearly. Uh, it, it's happening already, and it's just going to continue for sure. Yeah, and Thank I think you guys. actually uh, Equinor has actually been a leader in, in that unmanned space for pipeline inspections and all of that. And, and we are seeing some, some trialing going on at the moment for unmanned scour protection in, inspections, you know, export cables and, and all of that and protection of cables and all of that. So I, I would expect that that would further uh, increase. And I would, I would think if you want a good indicator, you look at where the insurance are paying most out for, for damages, you know. Uh, then, then this would probably be the first area that would be having, let's say, more enhanced inspection regimes uh, from that preventive and predictive maintenance part of it. Right. In the interest of time, I think it would be only fair to let Alexandra and Morton have a, a final uh, uh, say on, on the, the t this topic. So, uh, Alexandra, if you care to comment. Oh, okay. <laughs> Uh, on on autonomy and uh... or or if you'd like, I mean. Uh, no, sure. I, I was just because I just just answer it. But yes, I I I think I agree with Johan. It's already here. It's partly definitely here, and I think it will be a bigger part in the future. And and that's just in. There are things about automation. People are as good as the decisions they make, and if we can get better decision-making tools to the personnel and the people, which is a key part of this industry. And they can also do a better job every single day. So I think that's another important area that, that we are certainly looking at. How can you get 
the best information to the people making all these decisions every single day to have efficient operations. Thank you. And Morten, final words? Yeah, I think that's a, that's a very good point. And I also uh, think, uh, I mean, automation is, is definitely here. And, and as we, we are currently looking into to both uh, subsea drones as well as uh, air aircraft drones, so to say, uh, and autonomous EROVs for our operations. And uh, I, I think that's that's where we can definitely build on experience across both uh, over in the entire energy field, uh, so to say. And I also, on my behalf, I, I also hope that we will be able to actually transfer some of the uh, technologies we now see in, in offshore wind over to the more traditional oil and gas uh, operations we see. We've seen a lot of, uh, of interesting uh, uh, solutions and so on from uh, during our current tenders, and it's already been, been mentioned like digital twins, wave forecasting systems, and so on, which we would like to explore more for our uh, conventional industry as well. Good point. All right, thank you. I suppose we are out of time. Nicholas, would you? Yes, I'd like to thank you very much. It's been a particularly interesting discussion as expected. Thank you to all of you. Ina, uh, Jesper, uh, thank you uh, to all the panelists for joining us. Uh, I really appreciate it very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank, thank you very much. You. Have a good day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.